So that brings us to the life cycle of sustainable analytics, which is what we're trying to talk about today. Uh, you'll see that this kind of has six different stages, but the, the, the important thing to remember is that that final stage is advocacy and innovation, like we've been talking about. Analytics provide real-time answers to the questions, what is going well and what could be better? And in doing so, they help fulfill basic human needs. We have this basic human need to, to not only improve ourselves so that we have a sense of confidence, but to share that improvement with those around us. And, and this is an important thing to understand. So as we look at this cycle, like what's going on in these six stages? Well, the first three are really important, really critical. We would think of these as kind of formal analytics. So we have the first is data collection and access. And there's a lot of things that go into that. There's things like data governance and policy. There's things like uh, interoperability of tools. Lots of different things that have to do with data collection and access. And so that one cell, that first stage, can be expanded to, to include many different topics. The next cell is data science and modeling, which is the statistics and forms of analysis and methods that we use to make the, the data uh, turn into insights, right? How do we get the data to become insights that are actual, actionable and mean, meaningful? And then third, visualization and workflow. It's very hard to do analytics without visualizing data and also without creating workflows that make sense for the professionals that use them. So that's formal analytics. It's an important step. And we can't say enough about how important it is to get good analytic systems in place. Whether you home grow them or rely on vendors to provide those tools, these first three stages are critical. And I would say that they're necessary for success in a sustainable analytics initiative, but, but they're not sufficient in and of themselves. And that leads to the second half of this, this cycle, which is basically re reframed as the fulfillment of human needs. So we have socialization of tools, which is helping people to understand the tools and, and how they're going to help them to be a, a better professional. We have empowerment of human action, which means taking data actually into a space where it can actually help people to innovate the university or innovate the program services and curriculum we provide. And then of course that final important step of advocacy and innovation. And again, both of these are necessary and sufficient uh, together that, that, that will make analytics sustainable. If you have one or the other, um, both, but while both are necessary, neither by itself will be sufficient to help make analytics sustainable. We see a lot of institutions dumping a lot of resources into the first three boxes, formal analytics, hoping that tools will somehow magically pay off and do the work and, and make a silver bullet situation where suddenly an institution's a different institution. But we don't see enough schools focusing on the second half of this life cycle, which is basically focusing on developing professionals. Uh, an important thing to understand is, is that if you want the institution to get better results, you have to help your professionals change their practice. And that's what this life cycle is all about. Now, there's need for data therapy. Because these two halves of the life cycle are kind of in different spaces, one in the space of technological infrastructure and the other in the space of human resources management, um, you need people that can bridge the, the worlds, right? We call these data therapists. This is a little bit moji of me, uh, and it says, don't let the data drive. And I think that that's important. I hear this throughout the higher education. It's being said a lot. Don't let, uh, uh, data driven, data driven. Everything's supposed to be data driven. And the thing is, is if it's data driven, then the data is driving. And what we want to do is, is, is let professionals drive and give them the tools that they need to drive successfully. And so we, we need data therapists to bridge this gap to, to help the, the professionals that we are expecting to use the analytics actually get success from those tools and not putting so much resources into the tools that we forget to invest in the people. And that's what data therapy is all about. Now, people will say, well, how do you do data therapy? What do you do? You go around and you ask people, how did that data make you feel? Right, here's a little cartoon. It says, I really like the user interface, but I still have questions about the data freshness, right? No, it's not data therapy in that respect. Data therapy basically is just a reminder to yourself that you're dealing with human beings and that if your institution is going to get better results than it got before, it will be human beings that actually achieve those results. Now, will they have tools in their hands? Yes. Analytics is an important part of this conversation. But when you're trying to socialize analytics, you have to remember that people will pick up a new skill, a new ability, if the person who's trying to ask them to do that is, is attentive to those human needs. And that's what data therapy is all about.